Good evening, church, and welcome to our Holy Wednesday service. Today we welcome as our guest preacher, Reverend Dr. Vusi Vilagati, a strategist, a theologian, a thought leader. I have had the privilege to serve with him in one of the circuits. Above all else, I know he is a child of God. And so, Rev, we are happy to have you here with us today. May I invite the congregation to stand for the call to worship. Come, let us sing to the Lord and rejoice in the rock, our salvation. Let us come and give thanks in God's presence and greet him with songs of praise. The Lord is a great God, a king supreme over all. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain heights are his. The sea is his. He made it, and the dry land was formed by his hands. Come, let us kneel and adore. Let us worship the Lord, our maker. He is our God, and we are his people, the flock he leads with his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Hey, it's great to be with you uh, here tonight. Every time I sing this song, the song is called A Thousand Hallelujahs. There's a line in it that gets me every single time we do it. It says, there isn't time enough to sing of all you've done, but I have eternity to try. And every single time I sing that, it just touches my heart so much. And um, as I was preparing for tonight, I just actually just spent a few moments thinking about some of the things God has done for me uh, since um, I gave my life to Him when I was 20. And uh, some of the things uh, are pretty epic, you know, like being healed of cancer to um, overcoming depression to um, meeting my wife over here, you know. So uh, these are some pretty cool things, uh, but they're just many everyday things, you know, like waking up every day and uh, overcoming all the challenges. And um, maybe as I play this intro, take a few moments just to think about some of the things God has done for you um, as we as we worship him Would rocks cry out to worship? Whose glory taught the stars to shine? Perhaps creation longs to have the words to say. But this joy is mine. With a thousand hallelujahs. We magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs, a thousand more. Who else would die for our reason? Whose resurrection means our rise There isn't time enough to sing of all you've done But I have eternity to try With a thousand hallelujahs we magnify your name Jesus. 
Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs, a thousand more. Praise to the Lord, to the Lamb, to the King of heaven. Praise for He rose, now He sing forever praise to the Lord, to the Lamb, to the King of heaven praise for He rose, now He reigns, we will sing praise lord jesus this song is forever yours a thousand hallelujahs a thousand more a thousand hallelujahs a thousand more lord we love you so much such a joy to gather together focus our attention on you, God, to say thank you for all that you've done for us, all that you're doing right now, Lord. Lord, I'm so grateful, Lord, that you are greater than anything that we face, Lord, and that you are worthy to be worshipped every day, every moment, every season, Lord. I thank you for every single person who's here right now, Lord. Just know how much you love them, Lord how much you love all of us, Lord. Those connecting online and those right here, right now. God, open up our hearts, God, so that we may be more aware of your presence, Lord. Your presence is everything, Lord. You are everything. So give us courage, Lord, to open up our hearts even more now as we worship you. May we not just go through the motions, Lord, but may we worship you in spirit and in truth. You give life, you are love, you bring lights to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart is broken and great are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you We believe it, Lord. Every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord. Let's sing it out. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath. Yeah. 
shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord come on sing that i know the earth and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing grace on you Lord. one more time in all the earth and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing grace on you It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, great are you, Lord. Let's just sing that a few times. And great are you. Come on, from your hearts. And great are you, Lord. We declare it, Lord. You are worthy. Last time. And great are you, Lord. We just love to worship you, Lord. We're so grateful for this moment in our lives with you, Lord. Amen. Please, please grab a seat. For the last 1,600 years, Christians around the world remember the last days of Jesus' life during Passion Week. Today is Holy Wednesday, as we remember the day when both Mary and Judas prepared Jesus to die. As the religious leaders offer Judas a bribe to more easily capture Jesus, and Mary prepares him to be laid in a tomb. Even more strangely, everybody believes Jesus must die in order to save them. Judas thought Jesus' capture would force his hand, and he would make a move to overthrow the Romans. The religious elite thought Jesus' death would prevent Rome from breathing more heavily down their necks. And Mary, who paid close attention to Jesus' teaching, knew he had to die to save God's people. She was also eternally grateful to her Lord for raising her brother Lazarus from the dead only a few days earlier. When responding to the call of Jesus, how will you prepare yourself in the days ahead? Let's now listen to the next story Jesus told to illustrate what the kingdom of God is like, the parable of the ten virgins. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. 
But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, good evening. It is my joy, I'm just putting this back in. It is my joy and privilege to be here with you this evening. And I want to first express my gratitude to the colleagues that are in this place. Um, we think of Ian, and thank you to Reverend Sangela. I... I love and admire these two colleagues they have deposited over the journeys that we've taken over so many years in my life in ways that have enriched my life and made it maybe a better life than it has been. But I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. I hope my being here is a small gift to you because this is a great gift to me. And we pray together. Lord, turn our thoughts into prayers and turn our prayers into love and turn our love into a life lived with you in obedience to you, the one who calls us to prepare and live ready to enter into your kingdom. In the name of Christ and for his sake, amen. So when you encounter the story of the ten virgins, you are made almost to choose between a number of things. Your Sunday school sensibilities about the story, the things you remember from that moment when you were either made one of those foolish ones or the wise ones, and you went home and cried because you didn't want to be the foolish one, you wanted to be the wise virgin. Or you have to try and figure out what did the story mean later as you have discovered it might have more layers. And in the choice of what Grace Point has done in this Holy Week, they've taken the story and put it and planted it into the heart of Holy Week. And so it takes a different texture, even the reading of a story of this nature in Holy Week. As Adrian read, he, he, he read that brief preamble to the reading, and he said, we have for over 160,000, now I don't know how to call numbers, 1,600, don't do that, don't do that, <laughs> 1,600 years. And, and as he says that, and then he adds a bit, and part of the bit he added, that all of the mystery of Holy Week and Passion and thinking about that story that we reenact in this week of the coming, of the living, of the dying, of that central week that we saw the mysteries of love becoming bare in the life of Jesus as he gives over his life to death. It's a powerful mystery of our faith. And so you then invite us to say, what do we do with virgins that are 10 in number? And the writers say, there could be a mystery in that story. So maybe if I were to give a sub-theme to my reflections, it could be something like this. And it's probably the, you know, the new lingo and twang to it. It's either you've got it or you don't. It's either you've got it 
or you don't. Something like that. And if you, if you think of it, I think it captures the heart of what happens in the story. But maybe let me invite you to reflect a bit. The story opens with the introduction of these big stories and that are happening in chapter 24, 25, and a little bit into 26. These stories that are called part of what theologians, in these fancy words that theologians use, Olivet Discourse. I don't know what that means, but all it means to me is those very tense conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples just before he dies. It's almost in those stories he tries and says, I have tried to walk with you for three years, and if not longer. And in the three years, there's a number of things that I've tried to crystallize in my relationship with you, in how I want you to see me, in how I want you to see God, in how I want you to see the world. And part of those things that I want to crystallize, I don't, I'm not sure, I am not sure what to use to make you feel them and see them and walk into them. I am not so sure if I were to write a thesis for you and write and say, number one, two, three, four, five, would you capture it? And then it does what is popular in Scripture. Then it says, let's take earthly metaphors, maybe perhaps stories that you've seen in your village, and take those stories and use them as part of the hooks to the mystery that I want to tell you. And we've called those stories parables. Somebody gave me a nice distinction, and I, and I want to play with it. I don't want to overlabor it because I'm not so sure. I haven't done more work to research it. And it says there's often a difference between a myth and a parable. And it says somehow when you are told a myth or a fable or something of that nature, a myth would often be used to tell to children or to tell to somebody a story in order to invite them to a bigger story. And as you invite them to the bigger story, often when it's a myth, it is to build up a narrative that says, this is how life might look like. And so myths in their nature would propose and build up a world. And as they build up the world, you would be invited to see. So if I tell my children a myth, and I would say, you don't know how it looked like so many moons ago. And then I can tell them even a stretched out story to drive home a lesson on resilience. You understand that? And I could tell a story, and you have told, you've been told stories as you grew up. But he says then a parable the difference between a parable is that sometimes it is looking at the same world that is created around us. And then somebody says, there's something that's missing in this world, or something is wrong with the world that we've built. And then he says, we take the, he takes that meat, and then they break it down, and they subvert it and turns it upside down. Then he says, sometimes parables do that. They take the world as we see it and subvert it. And when they subvert it, then you are invited underneath the text of that to see the possibility of a different world. So parables don't end well. They leave you in suspense. They leave you wondering. They leave you with a disquiet. They leave you wondering, which of the characters am I? They leave you wondering, do I, have I got it or not? That's what parables do. That's a lot for an introduction, isn't it? That's, when is this picture going to get to the meat of it? When is he? When is he? Then there's the juxtapositions that happen in the story, and there's five wise and five foolish. For every, for every wise, there was a fool. For every wise person, there was a fool. I don't know in your life if there is every wise person, there is a fool on the other side. But the, the, the juxtaposition is so, is so vivid. There was girls with oil. There was girls without oil. And there was, you know, 
this story happens at night. It doesn't happen in the day. I don't know why midnight is a metaphor here and not broad daylight. Why is the wedding happening in the dark of the night? Maybe, maybe, maybe it's happening in the night because they've been spending the whole day doing lobola negotiations. Who knows? Who knows? These things are all, all over the place. But whatever it is, when you read a story like this, allow the story the distances the stories create between people, the subversions and the alternatives and the dualities the story creates, allow those things to pour over you. And then, there is girls that have done more than carry their lights that are full of oil. Because weddings take long. They don't take, you know, it's, if it's a modern wedding, it's that getaway to Mauritius wedding that takes the whole weekend. But in the cultural setup, it is the fact that you have to take the whole week sorting out food and everything. And something does go out in the, in the course of the week. The food goes out, the scones go out, anything else could go out. I don't know in the case of load shedding if there are generators or something, but whatever it is, something goes out in this wedding. And in this particular case, it is the oil that goes out. I don't know whether the girls were told to prepare oil or not. But it seems like if you are waiting for a bride to take the bridegroom back wherever they have to go, there has to be people that have light to show the way. Watch that metaphor, because Matthew uses that metaphor that you are the light of the world. He carries it over. And almost the metaphor that suggests that you actually are, as the church, the light at midnight. Whatever then the form of midnight you could configure in your mind, perhaps you are. But let me move a little bit quicker. So the, the metaphor of wisdom in this, in this text, suggests one thing for me. It suggests that wisdom, it means something like abundant preparation. Abundant preparation. On the other side, foolishness, it is making assumptions about sufficiency. Making the assumption that I have enough. You know, when you've assumed you have enough, um, I have these lights, these load shedding lights that need to be charged. You know those ones? And when you assume you charged it after the last load shedding, and then you come with Vika the next day and you plug it, and then it's on low. You know that kind of feeling? So what does this mean? What does this mean? It would seem to me that the first thing I want to just hold out before us, it's not a lot, and I want to hold them almost in conjunction with each other. There is one thing that in life, because as the story unfolds, there's that place where it's tense in this gospel, and we ask what kind of God, what kind of Christians are these girls? If all of the girls are Christians, if all of the girls are beautiful, if all of the girls are dressed up for the wedding, if all of the girls have lights, if all of the girls have all of the things that make them qualify to be in here, if all of these people have the uniforms that church people wear, if all of these people sing the same songs at Grace Point, if all of these people do all of the things, and then there's one distinguishing factor. Do you have oil enough for midnight? That distinguishes the movement in the story. And then, as you then hurry up, the message comes, is the bridegroom is here? What's happening now? Would you rise up? And then the, 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 the smart ones, they will rise up, then they you know, deal with the weak, and then they have light. And the other ones discover we don't have light. And then the issue that becomes tense is, if you are a Christian, aren't you called to share? If you're a Christian, why can these girls that have more light, you see, like water for the minister, if they have more light, if they have more light, 
Why? That's good oil for the minister, you know. <laughs> if they have more light, why? Don't the other girls give them? Aren't they supposed to be nice people? Aren't they supposed to be Christians? Good Christians must share. And then those girls say, when they turn, turn around, they say, you go and find your own. This won't be enough. It's almost like get your own oil. You see, friends, there's things in life that no one else can do for you. There are tasks in life that you only have to do for yourselves. There's preparation in life, growing up in life, and making things happen that nobody else can ever do for you. You could have people to support you. You could have friends to encourage you. You could have the whole world to be around you. But there are things in life that when they have to be done, just you and you alone have to stand up and do them yourself. And it would seem at the heart of the Christian faith, that stuff, it is the creation of the heart of what it means to be a Christian. The identity, the forming of a Christian identity is an individual task. The forming of the virtues of what it means to be a Christian, it is my task. I could be in the crowd, I could, it could be nice in the crowd, but there are moments in life that I won't go through with the crowd. So then the things that are submerged deep, that you have nurtured and you have formed and you have created and you have allowed yourself to go, grow through and go through and lead, live through. Those things and the virtues that you must and grow through, those things become the things that are your oil at midnight. No one grows up for anybody else. Have you ever been, have you ever been in a moment when opportunity came and you were not ready? A business opportunity comes and you're not ready. You don't have the capacity. Or something happens and you're not ready. Or have you ever been in a moment that you were ready too late? And you can feel the door shutting. In your face. This story feels like a story of preparation. Preparation. And the idea of, you know, potential is not enough. Potential. All these people that are in the story, they all have potential, isn't it? But potential needs to be converted into reality. Potential needs to be converted into reality. So the, the preparation, the growing up, the becoming, the formation of who you are needs to be supplemented with activity. The identity that you are forming is only tested in your movement, in the, in the activities, the activity and the movement that you become. So potential needs to take reality. Oil in the alabaster needs to connect to that Peace that is called the wick. If you don't know what a wick is, it's that string that goes down. Uh, my grandmother had those lights, you know. That wick, that string that goes down to touch the oil, and then when it comes this side, it becomes the thing that you light. But sometimes, even the wick does need a bit of rattling in order for it to give more light. Sometimes you could light the, the lit wick, and it, it becomes smoky. It needs to be rattled a bit. And then more light. The Christian call and the invitation of Jesus is that a Christian is somebody that is actively preparing all the time. Actively forming and becoming. The second aspect of that is that the Christian is not just a Christian by doing all of the things that you can do. The praying and the reading and the studying and everything. The potential that you are needs to be translated into reality. Of service. The service is the becoming the light in the world. And I hope that in our walking together with Jesus, 
we will become the light. Can I say it differently, the same thing? I don't want to labor it too much. Your, your mental preparedness and attitude of readiness is critical for every task in life. For your life, every aspect of your life, you will miss opportunities. And the wise ones are those that, that give, give effort to both who they are becoming and what they are doing. And then, the foolish ones are those that do it. And we, we know all of them, eh? Don't, if, because I am so far away from my family, I can say I have some foolish ones in my family. Because I'm so far from them, no one will hear this sermon, eh? Oh, it's online, by the way. <laughs> Share it. Um, but the foolish ones, it's the moments when... I, let me carry the family metaphor. So if there's the one that has worked hard, there's the one that's just preparing their week to be lit by the other, always. And there's a sense in which they never really deepen their own journey to grow deeper and to brave through those difficult moments and patches of life. And then they never give enough, give enough time to learning how to turn their potential into reality. And opportunities come, and all they do, they sit and complain. And they can complain about their parents. They can complain about you. They can complain about their church. Even in church, there are people that complain. I hope there are no people that complain at Grace Point. Some churches I know, there are people that complain. But in every aspect, when you are tempted to complain, think about what, what else can I do to get ready for my next moment? Because God is calling us to grow. And in this Holy Week, as I conclude and as I close, I am not going to conclude and close ten times. I only conclude and close once. One of my favorite philosophers in the Catholic Church, Michael Novak, talks about belief and faith in this manner. He says, you only truly know how deep is somebody's faith when it has been washed through a number of things. And he says, you know, there are the things we believe, common things that we believe, that we can say in front of other people. That when a storm comes, they washed away. Then there are the things that we probably think we hold dear and the beliefs that we, you know, we just think are the things we believe and we want to be. When we are with people, we can kind of like try and say, this is what we believe. He says, your core beliefs in reality are the things that remain when midnight and the storm has come and everything has been washed. Those are your core beliefs. And in the heart of Holy Week, that's what happens to Jesus. He becomes truly who he is. He allows himself to love the world up until his love is laid bare on the cross. That's Jesus. That's the core of who he is. And the invitation in this parable is, how prepared are you? Do you have enough oil to take the journey to the cross? When when the hatred, when, when, when depression comes, when the cross comes, when the friends disappear and Peter, and Peter denies you, will you have enough oil to stand through that? During COVID, we discovered how much oil we had and how much oil we lacked. And may this week for you, be a time of refueling your reserves of oil. In the name of Christ and for his sake, amen. Come, let us pray. May your invitation to, to the art of preparation the daily exercises of living with you 
loving you, worshipping you, and loving our neighbor and honoring them deepen in our hearts. May we, as we walk into the world with all of the gifts of spiritual gifts you've given us, may we translate that into light for the world. Help us to become light in the darkness of the world such that our being becomes a source of life and light even in the moments that are death-threatening. Help us, O oh God, to walk humbly with you, to carry the cross with you this week. And as the hardness of the week comes, fill our lamps with your spirit and your anointing. For Jesus' sake, Amen. Catchy phrase. It's either you got it or not. For our meditation and reflection throughout the week, we have used symbols. On Monday, we put stones beneath the cross. Yesterday, we wrote notes and placed them on the prayer net wall. Today we will light candles. Now the beauty about symbols is that they enable us to ponder aspects of divine truth and the mysteries of faith. As Vusi has proposed, perhaps the oil in the lamps of the wise represented represented their righteous living and obedience, their spiritual preparation. In a moment, we will come and light candles. And we, we do this as a symbol of lighting our own candles from that light of Christ, the light of the world. And as we light these candles, may our own lamps be filled up and may the light of Christ in us shine bright as we journey through Passion Week. Greg will be playing um, as, we, as we come and light the candles.
We thank you, Lord God, for Jesus Christ, the light of the world, the light that illuminates all darkness, the light whom darkness can never extinguish. We pray, O oh dear God, that you, you shine your light over our nation, that you shine your light in those dark places of our society and in the dark places of our own life. Jesus Christ, light of the world, shine on us. Amen. Friends, we come to the end of our service. Receive now the blessing of God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>